not go there? Okay. Hi, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see old friends and perhaps some new ones. My name is Betsy Cohn. I'm a professor in the School of International Service where I've been teaching for about nine years. And 20 years of experience teaching my area of expertise is uh, on U.S. foreign policy on Latin America, but I bow to the cabal in the corner there <laughs> who are the preeminent scholars and uh, practitioners on U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. And in the land, so I've got much more interest in my passion has always been teaching. And you can come to my office and you can see the drawing I did when I was, you know, the drawing you do in first grade when it says what you want to be, your self-portrait. And the legs go, you know, the body is really long and there's no room for the legs because you run out of space. And a teacher writes your name on it, says Betsy. And what it says is, I want to be a teacher. And I found that uh, in cleaning out the attic at my parents' house and uh, put it up in my office. So I've always known I wanted to teach. Last year, SIS, where I uh, am housed in the School of International Service, they named me the SIS Faculty Coordinator for Teaching and Student Learning. So I do a lot of CTRI workshops, SIS workshops, and work with faculty who are interested in thinking about improving their teaching. So I'm very glad to uh, see such a large, I'll say lively group, from at least some of us, and my plan for the day is to talk about active learning, but not just to talk about it the whole time, to actually get people more engaged. I did a little focus group for those who were here a little bit earlier, in case you missed it, and came up with a plan based on that focus group. And the plan is that we're going to do introductions. I'm going to keep it simple, just in the interest of time, and ask everybody to state their name and their academic unit so that uh, you can, as people raise their, you know, introduce themselves, you can look around and say, oh, I didn't know, I'm new to econ, here's somebody who I can talk to about teaching in econ, and that's my purpose for doing that. And uh, I often do one other thing, nothing in particular jumped out at me other than just to ask if people, uh, felt that they are new or intermediate or advanced in their uh, expertise in active learning. So one of the things that I do with my students in the first day of class, where it, so I, I get that stuff out of the way. So this is what I do with my introductions. It, I'll just say to you, how, how many students are freshmen? How many are sophomores? How many are juniors? How many are seniors? How many live on campus? How many live off campus? How many studied abroad? Whatever it is we want to know. And people just raise their hands. Because nobody remembers that anyhow when you do that. So let's just, before we say that, how many have just raised your hand, self-identification? It's okay, it's a safe group. There's no dean here. No one's going to tell anybody anything. There's a former dean, but he's sworn to secrecy. Cone of silence? Okay. And the question is, do you consider yourself, do you identify as someone who is new to the idea of active learning, intermediate, or advanced? And I define active learning as any activities beyond the lecture or discussion which engages the students in participation, where there has to be some in student involvement. And that can be something really complicated like a simulation and gaming or role playing. Or it could be uh, more sort of uh, the most basic or simple one would be called think, pair, and share, which is you give the students a question, you ask them to think for one minute, you then ask them to pair up for one minute and share with each other, and then uh, or two minutes, and then you ask them. To some, you can do it where you ask them then to go into groups of four, or you can then just ask them to report back not everything that was said, but maybe something that's most interesting that was said, or what I like to do is what questions do you have from this think, pair, and share? So it all depends on what your, uh, your learning goal is, all right? So think, pair, and share is something that uh, a lot of faculty use. I actually have a handout with 10 active learning exercises described in great detail. And I copied it for you 
and I will distribute that not now because we all know what would happen. <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> what would happen? <laughs> you would read it, and you wouldn't be paying attention to what's going on in the classroom, right? In this, in the workshop. All right. So the question on the table is, how would you identify yourself? Beginner, intermediate, or advanced? So just show of hands, how many would say they're a beginner when it comes to active learning? Okay. Intermediate. All right. And advanced. Okay. So we all know who we can now learn from. Let's go around and just introduce yourself, your name, and talk to everybody here. In the park. Okay. Um, I'm an adjunct at COGAD now, but at the end of my, after I retired from my business career, I taught in Montgomery County High School, especially Walt Whitman. And obviously the public school system is very much involved in active learning and training. So the various methods that you talked about were those that we employed very much so because you have uh, attention issues with younger ones. Now that I'm at the college level, we have a tendency of more lecture and the need to get through more material, but these students have been brought through the public school system and active learning, <coughs> and we have to maintain it also at the college level. You raise a really important point, which is that Active learning is what the students are used to at the high school and secondary at secondary level. And that we in, at the college level are really far behind. And uh, I went to a teaching conference this summer called The Teaching Professor. And you know, people were pointing out that this generation, this Instagram generation, the polling of, you know, CNN's definition of news is they poll the people who are watching and then report it as news, right? <laughs> These people are you Facebook, right? That everyone is used to being polled or asked or engaged all the time. And then think about what your classrooms are like. So it is the challenge that we face. And so that's why I want to talk about some of the exercises that are some I am talking to a friend who's a uh, high school guidance counselor and I showed her the handout she's like of course what are you talking about we do this all the time so it's what our students are used to all right so some people just came in late you want to introduce yourselves your name and your unit I'm Shadi Mokhtari Minasaya anybody else mm -hmm. Math and statistics. Oh, two math. And Chi Jen from Kola School. Okay, several. All right. So let's talk about. So as I mentioned, active learning can be a group. Well, it can be group work, but I, I want to table that in a sense because it requires a whole separate workshop on how to have students work effectively as groups. And I can send anyone, if anyone is interested in that topic, I can send you that. It's, uh, as it, but I consider that basically a separate topic. <coughs> it can be includes, one could say it could include, active learning could include discussion and how to ask good questions, interesting questions. I think that's a separate workshop. I'm happy to do that or send you to material, particularly by a woman named Mary Ellen Weimer. I heard her speak as the plenary, if anyone knows her work. She has a book I just finished reading called Learner-Centered Teaching, and uh, Mary Ellen Weimer, and she's phenomenal. And I will just give you this, the nugget from her plenary, which was to surround the questions with silence. With silence. Did you yeah. To surround the questions with silence. So when you ask a question, sit with it. Did you notice how long I waited before when I said, do you want to know anything else about everybody in the room? Most faculty think that they wait 10 seconds before asking when they've asked a question and then call on somebody. Studies show it's more like two to three seconds. 
So surrounding the question with silence, I think, goes a long way towards improving class discussion. But that's a whole separate talk. <coughs> As I said, simulations and gaming and role playing, even experiential learning, those are all examples of active learning. But it's, I think, a, a, that would require you to upend your courses. I didn't focus those as the activities for today because my goal here is for you to walk away with at least two or three ideas that, that you can actually execute in your classes this semester. Okay, that's my goal. So can we talk about why active learning is important? I want to do this not just by lecturing, though I have my lecture notes here, <laughs> but by using an example of active learning, which is to brainstorm. Brainstorming is a, is a technique that's used in business quite a bit. So is there anyone from COGOD who knows about brainstorming who can explain it? Sure, brainstorming is getting a group of people together. So is getting a group of people together and throwing out as many ideas as you can in a short period of time. My experience with brainstorming in business is that um, one of the things that we talk about is that to make it work, you, you don't want to judge. You don't want to judge the ideas up front, but that almost seems to always happen. So someone says, "Oh, I have this great idea," and then the boss says, "That's stupid. It'll never work." So, my experience has been that brainstorming has not been particularly effective in a business setting, particularly when the boss or the senior person is in the room. Otherwise, it tends to work pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so you've just given us a, a really important tip, which is when the f faculty member is leading the brainstorm. They have to pretend they're not the boss and that they're the facilitator and you are the scribe. So your job is to just write and not to comment at all, as hard as that is. Put the cap of the pen in this hand and squeeze it if necessary every time you want to open your mouth, okay? And just, it's like giving yourself a little electric shock. Right? So anyone else you want to add from Kogod about brainstorming? Has experienced it? Very similar to focus groups, essentially, because even there, uh, if you have relationships which are not homogeneous, that is, if you have a husband and wife in a focus group, you know, it doesn't really work. Uh, it's always suggested you have similar people so that they can share ideas more freely. It's very similar to the same idea of brainstorming. You wouldn't have a boss and a, and, um, and a subordinate. Uh, so it's, there are various situations where you, you know, we, had, we conducted focus groups with uh, people of different income groups. You wouldn't combine them together talking about debt and loans because they would not be talking very well. All same, right. same ideas. Well, John? Um, frequently, I think it's, it's effective when you have the students write out the ideas on the cards and you paste them to the wall around them so they can see them all around the classroom. So how would you do, how do you do that? So uh, it's I bring in poster board and I basically have someone with a marker and as the kids are shouting out ideas, they're writing them down and it's their job to put them up and that way it also gets me out of being there. So one way is to have the students do it. Do you have them do it all as one class group or break them into separate groups? It depends on my class. The bigger classes I have to break into groups, but typically in my smaller classes it's everybody yelling at once. So John has raised a really important point, which is that depending on what your learning goal is and depending on what your context is, you could conduct a, a brainstorming in a different way. The goal of a brainstorming, which comes from business, is to generate new ideas. The idea is to get out as many ideas as possible, even if you think they're not good ideas. And so it's important to tell the students <coughs> that they can disagree with what's been said before but they can't comment on it directly. So they can offer an alternative answer or contradictory answer, but they can't directly have what's called crosstalk, no crosstalk, okay? And this is described more fully on my handout, which, apologies to the older folks, <laughs> I read two pages to one, but it will be. I'm looking at you, Sally. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, harsh. I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest. <laughs> and the most incredible. <laughs> the second oldest. And the most against the ambassadors over here. So uh, the brainstorming is explained here, and so you'll have more. I'm going to post this to our Blackboard site. So. 
I will tell you, so the purpose is to generate lots of ideas. So think about how you might apply that in your classroom. But then it, the question is you have to do something with them. It's not to just leave them hanging. Don't leave it hanging in the room. The idea is then not to be the boss and say, okay, which is the best one here? Or I'm going to tell you what the best one is here, or best idea or whatever. But is to ask the students. And it depends on what your learning goal is. So let's start here. I'm going to ask. I'm asking you why is active learning something that you might want to include in your classes, or why do you think it's important? Why the heck are you here on a day and, uh, in the middle of August? So I'm ready to be the scribe. I'm ready to write. So shout it out. Helps them retain the information that's been discussed. By the Better attention. Help validate their thought processes. Think about choices. More fun in learning. Say that again. More fun. More fun. <laughs> Improve the engagement. But I think they need to think, this will help them think about the costs of the choices they make. You I, just want you to, I just want you to know, three times now I've squeezed the pen top. <laughs> <laughs> you Go get on. out of something what you put into something. <clears throat> the more you put into something, the more you get out of it. Keeps them away. <laughs> <laughs> did a shorthand here and I didn't tell you about it. The S stands for student. Okay? I Spreads the involvement in the class. And it's open questions. You get the same five people that keep answering everything, but active learning can get everybody to help you evaluate where they are. One of the things I'm doing here is using, if you notice, I'm trying to use exactly the words that you have stated as opposed to putting them in my own words. Promotes critical thinking. Preparation. I was just there. I just um. I just uh, preparation. One of the things I just mm, what I just did was validated one comment over another, and that is not a good idea. Okay. Sometimes you just got to squeeze. Gives you a variety of teaching strategies. One of the questions always that I have is trying to figure out when to end a brainstorm. It's a good question, I think. Is it, are you milking it dry or are you allowing everybody to participate? You have to make the call yourself. I, I base it pretty much on do I think I have enough to work with as far as what my learning goal here is. Anybody have anything else to add? Why active learning might be useful in your class? I also think it builds uh, cooperation among students and team building. Learn where students are.
Anybody else? I will add some of my own, which is that it, um, well, some of the, it's, it's here in different ways, but I want to just emphasize it, which is that active learning promo it's motivates the students. That they will, it, and this relates to maybe, maybe a couple of that have mentioned, which is, so it increase, increases student motivation to prepare for your class. Because students will triage. They're intelligent human beings. If they know that they're going to have to speak in my class based on their reading, they're going to do my reading. If they know that they just need to sit and listen to what you have to say, they won't do the reading as one student said to me. Why should I do the reading? The professor's going to tell me everything that was in the reading. Or if I've done the reading, why should I go to class? It's boring. So it increases student motivation. Uh, uh, for preparation, which I think is sort of putting together a couple things that were there. And also, peer accountability, which is the literature has shown that students will work harder when they have to be accountable to their peers. It's a humbling note, note, notation, note, right, as opposed to working for us. They would much, they don't want to look stupid in front of their peers. So if they're going to be put into active learning groups and have to say something, they're going to work harder. And uh, that because they're trying to impress their peers, Angela O'Donnell wrote about this in a handbook of educational psychology. And a lot of, and I also recommend to you this book, and I'll have it around by Nikichi, N-C-K-E-A-C-H-I-E. The Kichi's teaching tips. I think I know CTRL has a copy of this. It is the 13th edition, and uh, it actually has wonderful chapters. If you are new to teaching, I really recommend this. And I'll I'll put this up on the Blackboard site for the <laughs> citation. So students also need uh, it's as you said. So let me ask you. Is anyone not convinced? <laughs> I'm a bit confused now. Okay. Uh, I'm very convinced, but I'm a bit confused. <laughs> it's just that students are okay. uh, oftentimes with active learning. Um, so you say motivate students to prepare. I, I believe it. It's engaging. Um, but what's the difference between putting them in groups and having them talk to their peers versus you know their names, they know each other, and you're calling on them? And again, if you're thinking, they feel awkward in front of their peers, it's the same deal, isn't it? What's the difference? I'm there is a difference because, and, and maybe I need to go through more of the exercises. If you're breaking them up into small groups and you're asking them to explain something, they need to and put, some, and put an idea in their own words or uh, in the think, pair, and share, for example. You have uh, made them accountable to each other You've asked them to think through something and develop an argument and an idea to evaluate information, which is critical thinking. To perhaps it depends on what the exercise is, but it can uh, you can ask them to weigh ideas. I do a brainstorming. For, I'll give you an example. I do a brainstorming on why the United States went into Vietnam. Right? I could lecture at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but it's boring. It's much more fun. I have them brainstorm, and we get 18 different explanations based on the reading about why the U.S. went into Vietnam. And then I say to them, which is my learning goal, I want to teach them how to conceptualize, how to organize information, how to synthesize. I say, 18 is too many to remember. Can we group these? Can we put them together in this brainstorming and come up with no more than five? which ones are geostrategic, which ones are economic, which are bureaucratic politics explanations. And then I go around and I put, okay, this one's geopolitical, so that's number one. Any other number ones, number two, I'll put number twos, number threes. 
and then we pull that information together. But I get that that and them to do that process, as opposed to me lecturing and saying, there's geopolitical reasons, there are economic reasons, some disagree, I'm a bureaucratic, blah, blah, blah. And then I ask them, which is right? And the answer is, there's no right answer. <laughs> that it depends on what your evidence is that you can demonstrate and which is most convenient or most important or significant based on the knowledge that they have. So that they then have to prioritize, not only to organize and synthesize, but prioritize. So those would be reasons why, in this case, you might just, in the example of brainstorming. So just to uh, follow the loop, so at which stage would you, would you actually divide them in groups and get them to think through and then come up with which is their uh, pairings and groupings and what's the best, or is it sort of open to the class? Just, just trying to follow through your example. Yes. The answer is it depends on your learning goal. Okay. It depends. Uh, my recommendation is to mix it up, especially with this Instagram generation, which is used to being, let's remember, we always complain that they won't read. They stayed up all night and read The Hunger Games. <laughs> they'll read. They'll work. Mm -hmm. They will focus. They will sit and work really hard if it's interesting, if it's relevant, if it's important to them and significant in some way. And so this is uh, what I do is I try to make it significant, interesting, or relevant. And so it depends on, and sometimes I do it as a whole group. If the group has a certain dynamic where I want to bring it together more, I'll do it as a group. If I feel that there's sort of what we see more and more in our classrooms, the bimodal classroom, where you have some weak students and stronger students, sometimes I'll purposely mix them up so that the <laughs> weaker ones and the stronger ones are teaching each other. Sometimes I'll put the weaker ones together, the stronger ones together, let the stronger ones fly, and I you know, work more closely with the weaker ones. It depends on the context. There's no color by numbers here. There's no paint by numbers. It's a question of what your learning outcome is and what the context is. And, but my, my recommendation is mix it up. Doing the same thing over and over again is boring, right? Maybe you do eat mac and cheese every night for dinner. I don't know. I couldn't do that. Everything, my examples are always food. I went to a talk this summer. It was all about sports metaphors. I got most of them. <laughs> it was great. It was about giving feedback. Think of yourself as a coach. You don't just tell them what they did wrong, but you tell them what they have to do right. Isn't that great? It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant re revelation for me. You don't just say, you're hitting, you know, you're hitting your, your shoulders too low. You tell them you gotta lift your elbow. I don't know, am I doing this right? <laughs> <laughs> you can, <laughs> John, am I doing okay? Yeah. All right. All right, so... You playing fast pitch or hard? Or hard <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so, see, I'm actually confused about where our interventions come from here. Do we have any interventions? Yes. This is one of the things that's really important. So, also, this student body, the Instagram generation, is, is another reason why we need to do active learning. Are this really important, I think, with active learning, that you have control of the classroom, but that you, you have control of the learning, but you're letting go of control of the classroom, right? So you have control of the learning. You have an idea, a vision. What do I want them to learn from this exercise? What information or skills or competencies do I want them to gain in the next 75 minutes or two and a half hours? Particularly if you're teaching a block class, you know that no, the studies show that 20 minutes is it, folks, for the attention span. Which is why I planned another <laughs> exercise or something for us to do right now. So let's, I mean, but what you pointed out here, and it's not just me and bad planning, which is active learning is more chaotic. It's more confusing, and some students don't like that. They're linear thinkers. They want to come in and they're ready to take their notes and in rote form just write down everything you've said. There, I've been to several <coughs> workshops recently that that does not 
actually achieve long-term learning. It doesn't ever go into the memory core. And so if you're really concerned about student learning, I always try to frame it now in terms of student learning, not teaching. If you also, if you make that little shift, you're not about teaching, it's about student learning. What do our students need to learn? And so these are some of the exercises. So what I want to do now, so you're, but you've raised some good points, which is you never brainstorm unless you do something with it. So I, uh, in the interest of time, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but what I wanted, because I want to get to some specific exercises, okay? But you might, if you were in the School of Education, you'd say, okay, which of these do you think, you know, is, I don't know, who's in the School of Education? What might you do with this brainstorming list? If you're trying to get your students who are going to be educators to think about the importance of brainstorming and active learning. Well, I, I teach health in the school. So, I, so I'm always relating it back to like human behavior and decisions about health. So it's just something like this, hearing you know, what the challenges are, what the different ideas are, and then I would bring it, bring it back to that if you're, for example, if you're training health educators to know about different perspectives and how you can move people on to actually changing health behaviors in a positive way based on what you learn from your brainstorming exercise. This is one. Okay, one so that's one, one way you use it. Okay. Has anyone used brainstorming in their classes? Thank you. Can you give me an example of what you've done? Um, I teach, um, I do a lot of it more online, but I have used it in my class. So um, one activity, I have them read the, uh, this book on the spirit test of you and you call them. Yeah. So the brainstorming activity, they have to come up with questions. So they have two parts of the assignment. One is to come up with questions and they have to brainstorm. Questions and ideas that they have that would um, make good questions for further discussion and then the questions are then grouped according to themes by the students. So I don't even put questions out. I used to, when I started teaching this, I would stand in the front of the classroom and I would have a discussion on these different topics related to the book and it just never, like you said, no one would ever read. So I kept changing the process of how I would get to the main point and, and the pieces that I wanted to select to talk about in the book. And so now what I have the students do is they actually have to write the questions themselves. They post them um, and then they're organized. Part of their assignment is organizing them into topics. Uh, questions that are related, and then they have to select one and respond to that question. Um, so I use it that way. And also, I've used it other ways. Why do you know why do health disparities exist? And so right. people would brainstorm, and then that would sort of be in the beginning of the course. Um, but now, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I might even take it another step and um, put them into these teams of you know and uh, why they exist, and then have them work for a couple courses. Because I usually teach a, teach a block class. Uh, a couple uh, set um, <coughs> weekly lessons, and they have to work on teams to build um, and support why they chose that category. Because with the block class, like you said, I can't teach for three, um, right. three hours. So I think what I'll do is ask the question now, build them in teams. But I also use, and I was going to ask you your thoughts on this, <coughs> other than uh, reading outside of the classroom, bringing in additional materials that they can work on in class. Or does that take away from the concise? Um, you know, part of them working in a team. Like if they have additional readings in, in a long class to support their ideas, I don't know. If it works for you, if you think that that is something that uh, would add, uh, then go for it. Everyone has to adapt to their own sort of personality, teaching style, and, and who they are in the classroom. I have done workshops on how to get students to do the reading. And one of the things that I do, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I only allow, their, their participation grade is only based on comments related to the reading. And the students have told me they do my reading, but, and they've never done the reading for any of their class. Well, but they would say that, but just <laughs> I know they do your reading. Of course. <laughs> but I get, so my point here is, I really, I spent a lot of time thinking about interesting readings and what I want them to get out of it. 
And if the reading's boring, I tell them, it's boring, but you need to read this for this reason. And then they'll do the reading. And then we can use that to jump off from, and then only in the latter part of the class period do I allow them to bring in other knowledge. I also do that to democratize the classroom. Because I teach international relations, I've got some students who've never been out the country, and others who spend the summer you know, traveling through Europe, I'm, you know, just for vacation. And so I use it to democratize the classroom and say everybody can get an A in this class based on just the material. It's not about additional information. So that's my political agenda, which is to democratize the class. I find um, brainstorming is a very significant part of case analysis. Essentially, uh, the sharing of ideas, the teacher as facilitator, it's, you know, you pose sort of the question, more of a Socratic and solicit various ideas based on the case. And the other application I see is in uh, we do a simulation. Now, in a simulation, the teacher isn't there. You have a team. And you want them to be democratic. You want to basically give them a model of discussion. So when you're not there, they know how to uh, elicit uh, everyone's responses on alternatives and next steps to take. Do you do simulations with your yeah, students? Yeah, yeah. Would you be willing to post to the bu our Blackboard site for this workshop your simulation ca uh, ca examples? Well, to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> we can, uh, let's talk about it. Okay. I think it's a very technical, specific business simulation. That's fine. So people, it's, it's, people either use it or not based on yeah, we'll discuss okay. it. Okay. So let's brainstorm if we can really quickly or get out some information. What other active learning exercises are there? And then what I want to do is discuss three or four or five that you want to discuss. Anybody have one? Yes, sir. Debate. Debates. Anybody else? I don't know if this qualifies as active learning, but uh, occasionally I will have a student I teach business classes. And occasionally I have a student that has a lot of practical experience in that. And what I will do is I will offer the, give the student the opportunity to student teach, and then I'll waive the graded assignment associated with it if he or she chooses to do so. And then what I do is when the, when the student does the teaching, I will sit in the back of the room. So it's, we're not co-teaching, it's not anything like that. I found that to be very effective to have a different voice and it, it gets the students more interested. I think that's a great idea. I wouldn't call it active learning because the students are still listening to someone at the, at the, mm -hmm. the sage on the stage. Mm -hmm. They're still listening to someone at the front of the room. So uh, I think it's a great idea though to bring in that practical knowledge and get students involved. Anybody else? Role Any? play. Role play. simulation and role play. Who suggested the role play? Tony? Role playing can be outside of a simulation. <coughs> In simulations people play roles, almost by definition. But uh, I, for example, have my students imagine they are an American ambassador somewhere giving a speech on a subject. They are, those are individual roles. They aren't collectively put together. So you can play roles individually and in group context. <coughs> and both work. Whereas a simulation, anyone want to add to that? The difference is simulation? Well, in the simulation, uh, you're asked to be a management team. So you're asked to make decisions as managers. So that, in many cases, in most cases, is a role play. And in most case analyses, you're playing a role. They, your 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 role may be CEO. Your role may be a consultant. So, yeah. So the simulation would be a whole class working together, like on the National Security Council or Congress or whatever. Whereas a role play might be a couple people or one one incident. How about the 
I can't say it concisely anymore, but some sort of like group assignment that they're working on. So for one of my classes, I want them to know about what resources are on campus to help students in trouble, if there's an alcohol problem or an eating disorder or something like that. And I might send them on like a campus scavenger hunt or bring their laptops to class to together, um, you know, look up resources in the DC area or things like that. So I don't know, what would you, what would you, kind of like group work? Yeah. That, yeah. Results oriented group work. A, camp a campus scavenger hunt is a great example mm -hmm. of uh, active learning. If it's for some purpose, okay. There's <laughs> 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 active learning for the students and teaching, right? So one thing I do in my classes is sometimes have students who are take for the time leaders. Okay. <coughs> so, okay. So student dis uh, student discussion leaders. And so let me ask you for those who have proposed some of these. Why do you, why would why would you have the students be discussion leaders? What's the advantage to that as opposed to you being the <coughs> um, It allows them to process the material in a new way. And this, is this, is with, this is what studies have shown, which is if you have to explain something in your own words, not in the professor's words, you learn it better. And I will uh, use this as a moment to say one of the ideas I had for this workshop, and I decided against it last night, was to give you each uh, one of these 10 exercises. So I'd pair you up in two. And so, you know, you two would have first day of class quotes. And you two have brainstorming, and you two would have pause to reflect, and you'd have quick write, and these different exercises that are here. Then I was going to have you, I, I, I'm telling you this to ask you what you would think of this idea, all right? I want you to evaluate this idea as a learning exercise in the classroom that you could use yourself. So you find a partner, read the description of this exercise, I give you five minutes so that you both understand it. Find another pair that has a different colored sheet of paper, which means a different exercise. You'd have two minutes to explain that exercise to the other pair, two minutes for them to explain their exercise to you. The bell rings, you have to find another pair with an exercise that is a different color <laughs> piece of paper. Two minutes to explain it, two minutes to explain it, and we do that three times, and that adds up to five, like, in the scheme of things, it would be almost half an hour. And you'd have learned three of the exercises, three or four, maybe. What's your thought about doing that? Brian? Speed dating, I like it. <laughs> Speed dating, exactly. You like it, why do you like it? Uh, just because it forces, I mean, it, you know, part of the challenge that I've witnessed in the classroom in the past is, you know, as you say, you get strong students and weaker students, and, you know, that, you know, unless you can find a tactic that actually forces someone to talk like you just did to me, you know, you just don't, you know, people will become wallflowers, but, you know, the, the, the wallflowers will naturally kind of recede and, and the stronger students will, will engage, whereas this is forcing, you know, again, kind of using that peer pressure to, to, to force interaction. Anybody else? You also have the press call. You said better retention. So the advantage is it's better yeah. retention because you have to be able to explain it. And because you're doing it iteratively on yours, you're learning that we tried explaining it to the other group this time and they didn't get what it was about. So then I have another chance to try to explain it to a different group. Right. And and also hear how they're explaining theirs to me and say, oh, I like that. They use right. Example I didn't use. It's, it's a minor downside, which is a possibility of sort of telephone, you know. If you get the first story wrong, <laughs> you can snowball. And I've seen that in similar kinds of simulations where I've had legal cases that students have been responsible for reading, understanding, and then explaining to another student. So how would you deal with the fact that misinformation could be presented by students? What are some ways you could deal with that? 
quality of the soul around her in the beautiful. So what does that mean? I don't know what that means. Well, you have to see if this, before the story gets too unwieldy and out of hand, fifth, sixth, seventh machination of it, um, are there intervals where people can present to check on the validity of what's being So they'd have to present to you? Yeah. Or to the class. Mm -hmm. So if they present to the class, then everybody's hearing it so that it's no longer the pair and share. A little bit. I guess it depends a little bit to a group. I mean, I haven't done so, this. So, right. Any other ideas on how to deal with the misinformation? Sometimes what I've done is, like in only works if you're a small, you know, a small group, is I go and you basically do that. You go around and say, you give them the opportunity to practice on you. Mm -hmm. And so then you kind of have to go around. So you can go around right. and, and listen to people. Practice, and then you, you, know, you make sure they have, you know, they're not making huge things and you offer, ask them a question and right. then go around to all of the groups to see if. You, you can't get 100% people to listen to the whole spiel, but you get them to highlight the key so, Right. So one of the downsides of active learning with students teaching each other is that you lose some quality control of it over what's said. Is someone... Uh, uh, Sally? <coughs> no, I'm just saying you've got to keep control of your class. Well, how... So here, are there any ideas on how you might... Besides checking in, which I think is a good idea with people along the way, how might you make sure that, and I would <coughs> ask you, not control of your class, you have to control the learning, yeah. which is a little different than the information, but the reality is you could be up here speaking, and I just, I just, I, I've had students show me their notes. <laughs> I'm like, I never said that. <laughs> well, what do you mean? You're putting these two ideas together. Or you wrote down just what was on the board, which you have no idea how to put those words together because I only put down four words. So are they really learning and getting the accurate information when you are in control, as you said? That's the humbling part <laughs> for me. It's that far side cartoon. Then we know that what you say and what dogs hear. <laughs> <laughs> blah, 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 blah. blah. Ginger. ginger, blah, blah. You got it. Blah, 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 <laughs> ginger. That's it. So what other ideas to... I was, okay. Sorry. I was thinking about feedback. You let the students that are listening to them to give you feedback. Meanwhile, you have control. Then you can listen to them and they know that, oh, they got the right information. Oh, there is something that needs to be straightened out. So you could um, just, th I'm, I don't know the answer to this. I'm, I'm, we're working here. So you could say, I'm the, what would be my name? I'd be the, I'd be Google, right? They could come and ask you questions. Or I'm the app that they can click on to ask me a question. So if anyone at any time is confused about the information, mm -hmm. they can come to me in the classroom and ask me a question. So that would be one way, yeah. I think it really depends. I mean, it sounds uh, similar, but not. I, sometimes I think if, if you don't have the exact timing down as mm -hmm. the instructor, it, it turns into chaos, and right. it doesn't. It doesn't work. So I think planning something like this, and possibly, and I don't. It's again, depending upon the time of the class, or the length of the class, I should say. <coughs> you could always use this as a strategy for teaching but then have a different strategy for measuring their learning. So if you're teaching a blog class, that could be the first part of it. And the second part is something that follows up to demonstrate um, a different assignment that demonstrates the learning that took place in those, in those topics. I just think it's, I don't I, I think it's really important to plan appropriately. Right. Um, and, and really, you say to not have control, you really do need to control the time and the way it works, but not necessarily what happens with it. And I think it can be very tricky unless you prepare to follow up with an activity to that then. And so let me, I'll give you, uh, go ahead. Oh, well, I, mean, I agree. I was going to say something similar, I think, the way that people like to have a debrief activity at the end yeah. that, um, that neutralizes everything, like, for instance, cell phone polling, right? You put questions that you want to make sure hit on the mega, mega issues of what you're trying to get the students to learn. You have them text in with their phones, and they the polls come up, and then you can see if there's like a big discrepancy. If everyone's saying A and the answer should be C, then you have your, your cue of where you need to focus and sort of redistribute the material. But I think if you sort of 
have individual students then teach the class and they got the information wrong, it's awkward to sort of single those students out and say, actually, you're wrong. Right. Having it in sort of a neutral format, like a, like a poll, you know, neutralizes that. So the poll is good. You've raised a really important point, which is when you have students participating in the class, they're going to say things that are stupid. Okay, okay, we'll just be clear. <laughs> right? So, what I say to my students is that everything is deserving of taking note. This is for discussion and active learning. Everything that students, that everyone in the classroom says is equally deserving of taking note. What that means is, if someone says something that's not quite correct, I'm going to have to say, that's not quite correct because I don't want the, everyone else to write that down if it's not quite correct. And I say, I know that hurts your feelings, and I'm sorry, and it just means you, and usually it happens once. If there's sometimes it'll be a student who does it throughout the whole <laughs> semester, <laughs> and that's a problem. But I try to do it in a loving way and supportive way, and the next time the student says something that's spot on, I'm like, that's a really great point, mm -hmm. and reinforce so that they don't get afraid to speak again. But I say to them, otherwise it's disrespectful, because otherwise, what am I saying? It's like, okay, I asked you a question, talk amongst, you know, talk, discussion, say something, whatever, and, you know, I'm not even listening, because then I'm going to tell you what you need to write down. Because that's really how a lot of class discussion, I think, goes. And I think that's disrespectful <laughs> to students. So if someone says something that is brilliant, I say, did you get that down? And they're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, then you need to ask her to repeat it. I don't repeat it because I'm not going to play echo. That's boring. So I'll do this time, and then the students finally get it. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't agree with that. Or that's not my interpretation of the reading. Or wait, I didn't miss, you know, but I have to say it repeatedly. Oh, you get that was a really good point. Did everybody get it? So there's a way to reinforce, but also call out, and it's tricky. I want to give you one example of an active learning exercise on the sheet, which I use, which is a way to have an exercise to bring together the most important points or it doesn't always correct everything but it's called the super sentence super sentence has anyone ever heard of this the super sentence i'm in a different world okay so the super sentence is at the end of class where you give yourself it literally takes 10 minutes which is surprising to me i think i think we should be able to do this in five but it takes 10 and whatever the main concept that you want to the students to get that day, you ask that question. So it could, you know, how is theory important in, in U.S. foreign policy? Or what was the role of sugar in Cuba's development? What, or whatever it is that you want them to get. And I just stand up at the board, I call on a student to start the sentence. And I write whatever they say. And I make them stop after a long clause or a short sentence. So you're asking the question. I ask the question. Okay. What's the question? Did you say what was Whatever. The what was the purpose? Of today? You can do it. Mm -hmm. What is the most important thing? That, why, that's what a lot of people do, which is what's the three takeaways? Or what's the most important thing? I'm a little more directed, which is, uh, you know, I'll say, how do capitalism and democracy uh, uh, conflict and coexist, you know, conflict in their basic uh, organizing principles. So it's, that's the main point I wanted them to get today. And then they'll answer it. And they have to answer it in one super sentence. So then someone adds something and someone can edit. You cross it out. You, you can cross <laughs> out anything. You can add to the sentence in, until it fills the entire blackboard. So it's not grammatically correct at all. The point is for them to get a summary of the main concept that you wanted to do, get them to get. And it has, you have to have consensus. 
everyone has to agree that that, that these, if it's, the question was, what are the most important points? I'll say, to, you know, the people listed, like, you know, mentioned like 18, eight, eight different points up here. I said most important. Are all of those really most important? And then they're like, well, no, we should say these four are the most important and then add these as later. So it's playing with the information, but having some kind of culminating exercise where the students can make sense of it. I don't do it every class because that's boring. My students love it. Sometimes I find the students get dependent on it. Like they're just waiting for the super <laughs> sentence. <laughs> they're not listening for the whole class. And I'll say to them, you aren't listening to the whole class, so we're not doing the super sentence. you got to get notes from somebody else. And I'm like, we're not going to play that game. There's, so any questions on the super sentence? Yeah, so are you the one that's scribbling? I'm scribing. Come up and do it. I'm scribing. Because I want control. That's important to have control because I'm the one who can say, you know, does this seem right to you? And this is where I do a little bit more leading. It's not, when you're letting go of the classroom for active learning, one of the criticisms of students can be, I'm not paying $50,000 to listen to my classmates. <laughs> and I feel their pain. Yeah. So I make, I'm very transparent. We're going to do this exercise today because it will help you understand this concept better. So I, they know that I'm not being the absent professor. I'm not just, it's not that I didn't prepare for class. It's I prepared, but this is what I prepared for you. Okay, so what if they put up thoughts or concepts or facts or whatever that are, in your judgment, either wrong or irrelevant or not really important. How do you handle that? I say to the students, does everybody agree that this needs to be, and that everything needs to be there? there. And, then and then a student will say, no, I didn't. And then the person who first offered that will say, do you, are you willing for an amendment? And it's this cooperative experience, and everybody is playing. And what if everyone's in agreement with the crud on the <laughs> blackboard? It happens. happens. Yeah. And I'll say, you know what? Um, then I'll say, tell me, how is it that you got that impression from today? What was it that was said that led you to believe this is important or this is true? And then I'll have to correct the record. And you do this in 10 minutes. And you do it in 10 <laughs> minutes. How large is the class for active learning? Well, it depends. You can do it in any size class. It depends the exercise. This, it is harder with, let's say, a 35-person class. That's what I was many of the stuff that you were saying, you know, correcting and walk around and mm -hmm. listening. My class is size 45. It's kind of hard to have small groups and do that. You can do this even with a large class, with 45. Mm -hmm. That one sounds good, the super sentence. Yeah. But this little groups and you listening in and if somebody, you know, the... So here's, all right, let's talk about with 45 students. What might you do in small groups? <coughs> How much you have small groups? Any ideas? Well, what I've done in the past is um, th there's often a, a group project, something that runs the whole semester, and I, I will give them time during class to work in their groups. Uh, it, this tends to work best if they have different problems to solve, and then I just stop talking and let them work in their groups, and then I walk around the room it's more of a mentorship than a lecture uh, option. And then each group will have different problems. And if they say, oh, everything's fine, I'll, then I'll probe and ask them questions. Because I tell them, if, you, if you're working on a project and you have no issues, that's an issue. Like problem-based learning. Exactly. Yeah, problem-based learning is a great way to work in, in large groups. And yeah. But if you've got a, 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 one of my classes, I break them into four groups, and uh, they'll do role-playing simulations each a group of ten at different points in the semester, and so when it's there, when they're in the middle, obviously they're actively involved. If you're one of the ten that day, but then the other thirty, you're kind of the audience for this, you know, unpredictable simulation going on. And they know that halfway through, I'll jump in and say, "Okay, we just found out those helicopters you sent to Sudan got shot down. Now what are you going to do?" So the audience is kind of interested in seeing how they're 
peers react to the unpredictability of the thing. So that's a way to do it, which is to have groups but not have them meet all at the same time or whatever. There's something called the Socratic Circle. Has anyone used that? Where you have a group meet. You could, it was 40. I break it into two groups of 20. So you have 10 uh, having a conversation in the middle, and then you have another 10 sitting around the circle outside. And they're all facing inward. And the 10 on the inside have a conversation, a question that you want them to discuss. And the 10 on the outside are observing. And then you ask them with some guidance to then ex um, talk about what they observe. And then you can switch it. So, but here's the thing. So you can have the question, the, this does raise this question of what do you have gr groups report back? I think summaries do not get at the key points. What I've been re hearing from a lot of the teaching workshops I've been going to, which is have students report back on key questions that come out of the group, or the most interesting idea, so that if that's reported back, then you as the faculty member can, deal, when, can address that. It does raise this question, the downside of active learning, which is you don't know what's going on in the last 15 minutes in that group. But you have to have some trust. You have to be willing to let go, and you have to teach them how to do this better. Better use of questions. Yeah, to ask them for questions. I know, this goes back to your point before. I, some faculty member talked about, he gives them a quiz on the reading at the beginning of class, but he tells them, Anyone who has any questions on the reading, put them up on the board, and I will address those questions before you have the quiz. <laughs> Sometimes the entire class is just the professor answering those questions. Sometimes one of those questions is so good, it's like, ah, that's the quiz question for today. And sometimes, you know, and so I thought that was a brilliant idea. If you're, now this is scary, especially if you're first starting out and you're new to the material, because those questions can be anywhere. And that is a reality, which is hopefully you've been hired and know your material. <laughs> <laughs> but I know from my school, you get hired sometimes to teach things you don't know that much about. And letting the classroom open is a scary thing. And so there are times when I just have to say, you know, I don't know the answer. It's a great question. I will get back to you. And you always have to get back to them. If you do that every class, you do lose credibility. <laughs> so some hands I saw. Yes. Yeah, before uh, being an adjunct here, I was an alumni auditor for three years. So I've been a student here. And from the student's point of view, um, one of the problems has been sometimes when you do an exercise, an active learning exercise, it's not adequately explained, there's confusion. So I think it's really important to present the instructions not only verbally but in writing. Really important point. Really important and point. I went to a workshop this summer. She did. Right. And to send time she expectations. Was MIT, she had all these fellowships. Yeah, because if stitches. Right. <laughs> you need time expectations. Can you write the instructions down? No yeah, one knew what no, to do. No, it has to be real specific because we assume students listen, but they don't. They don't. And we assume they read their emails and yeah. they don't. <laughs> Not from well. They now text. Sorry, but um, <laughs> both verbal and in writing and Timing also. Yes. And Actually, constant feedback. Right? Constant feedback. Constant as to, feedback. As to where yes. we are in the project. Yes. It takes a lot of work, and instructors ignore that part. <coughs> and students have already complained. I, I do a lot of um, active learning. In fact, one of them is uh, campus carving camps. And what I do was that the first day of class, I ask students basic statistics. Can you tell me anything you know about statistics? So they mention numbers, graphs, and all those things. And I said, well, go around the university and look for professor's research. And any statistics you see in it, try to describe it in the way you understand statistics. That's the first day of class. Then at the end of the class, when the 
the course is over, I let them go back to the same research work and see what, how much meaning they can make out of those research work based on the knowledge they've acquired throughout the class. <coughs> and it, 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 it requires a lot of, you know, you ask them whether they've done, they post it from Piazza, so you read it and then you comment on it, and then you go and pass by those areas and make sure they've looked at it. And if somebody reports a particular research where you don't have to, you tell me the building, the floor, and where you saw it, and I will, when I'm passing by, I have it on my little pad and look at it and give them feedback. Say, oh, wow, I saw it. And they, they like the feedback. When you give them the feedback, they're like, wow, he's interested in what he has given to me. And they, they go back, they say, oh, I want to redo it again. I, I think I can do it better, and things like that. So we do it constantly throughout the whole class. And when they get one idea in the class, they go back and say, oh, this idea now explains this part of the research. I like it, That's and fantastic. things like that. So, Fantastic. There are different ways, and one thing I've realized is that don't be afraid to fail. You know, you start something and it just comes out naturally as you begin to teach. And when those ideas pop in your mind, just, just try it. It gets better every time. I couldn't agree with you more. That was fantastic. What is your name again? Ineno. Last name? Ado. How you spell it? A-D-D-O. A-D-D-O? A-D-D-O. 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 Few students who are introverts and are really uncomfortable in this sort of active learning. How do you manage them? I don't put them on the spot initially. I don't ask them if in there are exercises to do where they don't have to well, for one thing, pairing them up or putting them in a small group is to their advantage. They're going to be more willing to speak to, with four than they are in whole class. So that's one way to deal with it is actually to their advantage to make it a smaller group that they speak in front of. Uh, and the other thing is I try not to problematize the introverts. I actually have more of a problem with the extroverts <laughs> who want to dominate. Yeah, yeah, sure. And so I, in my mind, I will say to them, you know, you haven't talked much. Is there anything I can do to make me more comfortable? Uh, I know there's a couple students who dominate. I'm trying to get them more comfortable not to speak <laughs> so we can balance it out. Here's something I'll do, which is one, uh, I'll call the one minute lecture at the end of class, especially a block class where a lot of things are chaotic. And this is also written down. So the one minute lecture, you give them 10 minutes at the end of class to write what would be a lecture that they could give in one minute. So you really have to synthesize. It's a, it's a great exercise, and I've done this on the role of Cuba's sugar in Cuba's history. If they gave me the history, they haven't synthesized. They've just regurgitated the history. They haven't analyzed and synthesized. And so then while they're writing, I walk around the room and I look and see who's got a really good answer. And it's usually an introvert. It's usually, I don't, actually I can't say whether it's introvert or shy or has other sort of personality things going on because a lot of times we don't know. I, I have looked at and, and gone to workshops on the whole this introvert thing and I'm not com completely comfortable with it. Some of it is cultural. A lot of our students are international. They are used to talking. Yes. So the personality could be different, but it's a cultural aspect. And it's cultural. Right. Oh, language. So when you say... Oh. And language. When you say you so, want so let me just... I walk around and I'll say to them, you know, I just I touch them on the shoulder and say, that's fantastic. I mean, would you be willing to read that aloud? So it gives them a chance to speak where they know they're going to say something wonderful. Mm -hmm. and not be called out for it. And I've also done that, I'll, I'll see students running, walking across campus who doesn't speak much, I say, you know today we're gonna discuss this. If I ask you about this, will you be willing to speak on it? Yeah, you give them advance warning. I give them advance warning and I prep them. Yeah. And then they walk in and I say, are you, re are you ready? And they say, because I say no is a possible answer. Mm -hmm. And then I won't call them. So we will. I do the same thing like you said, because sometimes people mm -hmm. come and say that, the class has a lot of active participation and I am, you know, shy, I am from Andhra I'm not used to it. So I just say, well, we'll have a pact. You know, you prepare on certain days. When you give me the sign, I'll call on you because I want everybody. And so by the end of the semester, they are definitely opening up a, a bit more.
But you mentioned something about democratizing the classroom mm -hmm. uh, by getting people's input on the material that was assigned as opposed to what they may have, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, outside of class. But but you still want, so if you're doing all this active learning, I'm assuming you are going to reward students who are doing, you know, who are participating versus what about the ones who are not at all? So somehow you get their information that they've actually read, but they're not talking? Okay, that's a whole other, um, <laughs> one of the things I do in my classrooms is uh, I assume, unless there's 40 students, and I can't hear them. But even with 35, I do an in-class writing assignment at the beginning of class. On the material. On the, uh, on the questions. So, well, on the reading. And so I actually brought some samples, but the purpose of it is to, again, democratize, again, uh, as in following on Bill's question, those who aren't comfortable in class. So these count towards their participation grade. So a student might not open their mouth in class, but they've done the reading the whole time. And I try to do eight or nine of these in a semester. So list the main factors that determine congressional power relative to the congressional power relative to, to the executive. So it requires retention. And it's always a reading question I've given them in advance. I'm not trying to trick them. It's always just, I'm trying to teach them how to be active readers. So they know that these will count. So someone might not have said a word in class and they can get an A in participation. And also, speaking of international students, we get a lot of them. I had a student who was Chinese. He was clearly t totally there but couldn't speak. And I just had this, it just came to me one day in class and I just said, say it in Chinese. <laughs> And he just said it in Chinese. What did he say? <laughs> what the hell no. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, that's great. We now know what it's like to try and learn and you know, hear another language and what it's like for this. I said, okay, now that you've, it gave him a chance to gather his thoughts. And then I said, okay, think about it. Think about it in English. Okay, now say it to us in English so we know what you said. And he could do it. But it was having that time, you know what it's like to learn a foreign language, perhaps, and having that moment just gave him that opportunity to gather his thoughts. And I thought it was great. What percent uh, do you put on uh, participation? I think that's totally up to you. It's the kind of class. I know we're doing more than 10%. But I don't use participation. I use contribution, and I have a rubric that defines it. So it's, um, it is subjective, but it's not arbitrary. And I tell the students that just come to class, I mean, you just show up in business, you don't get any credit for that. You actually have to contribute. And there's levels for it. And um, so this does a couple things. It dissuades people from just showing up. It dissuades the students who are just very chatty. They like to talk about things that are maybe not necessarily relevant. So there's a difference between talking and contributing, and there's actually different levels. Would you post that to Blackboard? It's pretty si it's very simple. Like I said, it, it's subjective, but it's not arbitrary. Yeah. The other thing I do, just real quick, is halfway through the semester, I or at least once before about midterm, is I will post in Blackboard my assessment of their contribution grade. Mm -hmm. That way if it's yeah. lower than they think, yeah. because I found if I waited to the end of the semester, then they would say, gee, I had no you idea that I wasn't that really, and you didn't give me a yeah. chance to actually fix. So I tell them that the grade in Blackboard is a snapshot. It could go up or it could go down. Mm -hmm. That's, That's fabulous. Great. I wish I had time to do that. I always need to do that. And mm -hmm. I so I applaud you for that. Sure, we go ahead first. And yes. In the school that we got before, we were just doing instead of giving them um, participation grades throughout the semester three times. We usually would do that after exams. We would give them a self evaluation participation sheet with different categories. So instead of just saying, oh, well, I show up every day, yeah, but you don't get worried and you don't do your homework. They give themselves a grade and then they have a section for comments. And then you can give that back to them saying, well, I disagree or I agree, but I think you could do more on this or something. Would you post that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice because it's not, I give you a grade and you have no say in it, and you tell me what you think would work, and I tell you how you can improve. Yeah, and it, it's a little more positive, definitely. 
And I use a participation rubric by John Immerwar, and I can post that. He's at Villanova. It's got five categories. The first one is preparation, then listening, then quality of contribution. And it's about moving the conversation forward. And only last is quantity. And I discuss this with my students at the beginning of class, and they're shocked that, that these other things are part of participation. And with my freshmen, I ask, the, the, I'm going to tell you, I do something called Ticket Out the Door, which is another active learning exercise. It's on the handout. I'm going to ask you to do a Ticket Out the Door. So it's a little frightening to me because this is, uh, anyhow. But you can give them an index card. I got the big ones because they're for faculty. I figured you might have a lot to say. <laughs> but they make them smaller. Or I do, and for the freshmen that I teach, on the ticket out the door, it includes what participation grade would you give yourself today? And because I want them to be reflexive. I want them mm -hmm. to be thinking about their role as students. And then I will comment on it. But it also, it, um, classic ones are in the ticket out the door, what was your what one main insight for today, or what's still confusing. And that's really helpful. Because if they hand those in to me, you can do it anonymous, not if you're at a participation grade. But you can do it anonymous or with their name, depending on what your learning objective is. Then I know, oh my god, I thought I was so clear when I was lecturing on liberalism, and they didn't get it. They say they didn't get it. So then I can either follow up with an email, or I start the next class, or structure the next class completely differently based on what they've learned. They say they're still confused on. You do this every class? With my freshmen, yes. John, um, there's a guy whose name is Stephen Brookfield, who is absolutely fantastic. He's got, a, I don't know, a dozen or so books. I just finished reading this one called Teaching for Critical Thinking, which is fabulous. <coughs> See, I'm, I'm breaking all my rules here. But he, in it, his questions I put on this form for you, He asks, at what moment were you most engaged as a learner? At what moment were you most distanced as a learner? What action that anyone took in class did you find most helpful? What action that anyone took in class did you find most confusing? What surprised you most about the class? And that's what he asks. And he, I heard him in a plenary, and he said, you know, the student wrote that they found they were most distanced as a learner watching the person next to them shop for shoes online. <laughs> and so he brought this back to the class. And he said, so what are we going to do about this? And, he ha and then they created a contract to create a more positive learning environment. So it's really important to go back to the students with the information you learn. It doesn't have to be everything. Something, you know. <coughs> Lizzie, can you repeat the five ticks that your colleague at Villanova I used to define, or po can you post them or something? I'm, I'm going to post that rubric, okay, because it's just so fabulous. Can those who are supposed to post, post it, because some of us are still cooking our syllabus, so we're going to <laughs> implement some of these things. So those who are supposed to post things on Blackboard, if they can do it sooner than later, it will really help. That would be great. Some of these and you things. know that we have a section for this workshop. Yes. <laughs> Go to Blackboard with this one with pop up then? It goes, you go Here. into the yeah. 2014 yeah. teaching. Yeah. And then within that, you'll be able to click on, on the left hand side, there is links for each day. Um, and when you click on that, it'll bring up the sessions, and you're also enrolled into a session 101 group, which is where these things will go. One more question. It's, it's just sort of an overall question. So I'm thinking about my courses for this fall. And I mean, I do a little bit of this stuff, but I also do a lot of lecturing, frankly. And they're introductory mm -hmm. courses, and we have to cover a ton of material for the semester. Do you feel like you have to dial back on your expectations for how much material you can cover the more you do this? 
or the number of readings you can assign. So it just seems like there's a bit of a tension there. There's a tension, but it's not as clearly defined as you just did. Because when you're covering material and you're lecturing at it, you're assuming the students are getting it, and they're not. All the studies show they have a 20-minute attention span. Okay, now, and so they're not, it, you're, it's actually not being covered. Well, so let me give you just an example. So you, let's say you want to cover a concept, and you right now have five readings on that concept, and they all sort of offer different perspectives on that concept, since so it's a lot. A lot so, to get through with this. Right. So this is an example. I'll give you one. I do. I violated exactly. I said I wasn't going to do. So, but I'll just give you because it was so brilliant. What I just learned from Stephen Brookfield. Okay. You have it. What's the topic? World politics. I know, but what's the five concepts? Oh. Um, all right, I, I can do world politics. So the, the United <laughs> <laughs> States power transition. So let's say I'm teaching about the U.S. promotion of democracy. And I give a history. I, I might lecture a little about the U.S. history. But there's realist, liberal, and construction, constructivist views on this. So I put three pieces of paper around the room for, with those names on them, right? Realist and liberal and constructivist. And so what I do is I might lecture and say, this is what U.S. promotion of democracy has been. From the readings, what would a realist say? And you let the students generate it. And it's from the article that they had to read. And then you'd go, what? And then you'd go over, what would a liberal say? Because they have a visual now, it's like, oh. She's in the back of the room now. And, you know, and, what, and, so, and then I would break them up into small groups. And I'd say, three, you know, you were based on the three theories. And I'd say, I want you to answer the question, should the United States be promoting democracy in Cuba? Only from those perspectives. Stephen Brookfield calls this speaking in tongue. <laughs> You first have to model for the students. They're not going to know how to think critically. They're not going to know how to speak from one perspective uh, over another. So I first teach them this. He, anyhow, I have to hold another workshop I'm giving. But <laughs> it's on critical thinking, and I can send you my notes on it, at least so far. Is there a way to center? I mean, we're going to get some of this information because we signed up for this workshop. But does CPRL have, like, central page where you click on group ex group exercises. There, you can Google a lot of this. There are other schools that have this. Yeah. I went to a workshop on this list at the teaching conference, and I actually stood up and asked, how many of you have CTRL web pages, Blackboard pages with resources on teaching? About 25 hands went up. I said, how many of you with the faculty use them? Two hands went up. Mm -hmm. so. We have five minutes left, and I want to do some summary exercise where I'm not speaking because I have violated the rule of active learning, but it was in, um, I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy with that myself. But what I heard was that people didn't have a lot of experience and they wanted to have more of the, the knowledge and sharing. So I'm glad at least that I was able to call on a few people. I'm curious to hear from the group about this one because um, we had every third class we had a discussion about primary source reading and we would use a lot of that brainstorming to kind of group and, 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 and potentially trying to group what you learn into you know, categories. Uh, but the class that we had where we had a debate had more active involvement than any other class we held that year. And I've decided that it might be the demographic of students, particularly in our university that maybe debate is more embraced by the student body than, I don't know, if I was at the university now, then I, I don't know. Um, but I'm intrigued by this concept, and I really want to work debate into future classes more, because they seem to be Well, more. I can, um, something I didn't talk about, but I will post, I do roundtable discussions. Again, uh -huh. it's my political belief that our society is too argumentative and then I'm looking more for analysis than argument. 
because of the way what I, the, what I teach in terms of foreign policy. So I'm trying, that's, again, it's just my thinking. Always be thoughtful about what it is you're trying to achieve. And so I have the students do roundtable discussions. I have a three-page memo I give them on how to do the research and what I expect. And then they follow up in a paper. And I can post that. But I can't speak to it. But I do think this is a generation that is used to being told on what they think. And they get bored very quickly. So hmm, I'm just going to do this, which is one more exercise I do, which is called pause to reflect. So I want you to write for yourself. I'm not going to correct this. Collect it or correct it. <laughs> P2R, pause to reflect. It's a takeoff on R2P, R2P <laughs> which is responsibility to protect. I made up this one. <laughs> and I do this usually in the middle of class when the conversation's going and I see the students, their eyes are glazing over. They just had information overload. And I just say, pause to reflect. And they write for five minutes, and then I'll say, who wants to share something? So pause to reflect either, I would say, what exercises do you think you could incorporate into your classes? Or what's holding you back from being more active, using more active learning? So just pause to reflect. What's holding you back? Now, the more positive way of saying that is, what would you need to integrate active learning more in your class? Active learning requires really good time management. It's not one of my strengths. So I encourage you not to do what you saw today, but to think about that. Because it does mean that you have to give up some of the content, if you will, of lecturing it. And what happened for me was when I heard that no one knew these sort of what sort of think, pair, share, and brainstorm, I went into the old professor mode of I have to lecture at them, I have to give them this information. And I caught myself up on that. But I would say bravo to you because you taught to the learning style that we required. Me personally, I put myself at the immediate. This was ideal and you integrated the right amount of active learning and the right amount of lecturing. So I say bravo to you for doing that. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm imagining some didn't feel that way. because, And that's what happens in the classroom, which is it will meet some certain learning styles, but not others. There's certain expectations, and that's the reality. The reality is also a straight lecture is not meeting everybody's style. It's not it, certainly not meeting many people's learning needs. I actually asked on a student information <coughs> sheet uh, about their learning styles. And would they, ra you know, so I, I asked some questions about that, which then helps me to try and target. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. For playing. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. good luck with